But tonight, um, Pastor Bill is going to take a break and uh, get ministered to. And I've asked pa uh, Brother Chris Johnson, if he would, to come and preach for us tonight. Let's put our hands together for Brother Chris and welcome him in the house of the Lord tonight. Would you do that? Thank you, Brother Chris. Amen. Now, don't act like your brother. <laughs> he almost said, Pastor Chris Johnson. <laughs> Let me go ahead and take up an offering right now. Go ahead and get that out of the way. I don't know why I'm a little nervous tonight. Uh, one thing, uh, one, one announcement that I, uh, Bill forgot to mention, Sunday at 4.30, the churches, the churches of this area is going to meet at Grand Ridge School, pray over the school, 5 o'clock at Sneeds Elementary, 5.30 at Sneeds High School. So um, you have an opportunity to go on campus and bring your holy water. Bring your oil, anoint it. Just make sure you don't put too much on the doorknobs that they can't get in the classroom. I reckon I'm a little nervous tonight for one thing. I had a message planned about Tuesday. I had that circle laid out, everything three or four points. <clears throat> I had it hammered out, memorized. God said, that ain't it. I'm like, Lord, I don't know what you're talking about, but that's it. That's got to be it. I know it. He said, nope, that ain't what it is. Um, I teach Sunday school. I'm not called to preach. I'm called to teach. I teach Sunday school, and I challenge any of you men and ladies, we have some ladies in our class as well. Uh, Nine o'clock on Sunday morning, I, we, we would love to have you. We have a great Sunday school class. But getting back, I'm an auditor by trade. And the way we test things is we get confirmation. If we're auditing cash, we get a confirmation from the bank. It says this is how much cash they had at a certain date. When God said, I want you to preach this message. I got three confirmations yesterday. The, one of the verses was on a television show. Lady called me last night with another one. And today I seen the same thing again. So I feel like I'm going to teach you. I'm not going to preach to you tonight. I'm going to teach you what God has laid on my heart but don't let me lose you because I'm going to take a hard right turn. And I said, God, this, this, this really don't go together. But when I conclude, you'll see exactly what God intended. I've only got two points tonight. With six. <laughs> two points with six subparts. Let's open up with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word most of all, Lord God. We thank you for blessing us with it, giving us a roadmap, Lord God, to follow. Thank you for this church, and thank you for these in attendance tonight. Lord God, open our hearts and minds to receive your word. In your name we pray, amen. I'm going to open up with a very familiar passage of Scripture. Then I'm going to somewhere you might not have ever been. Matthew 5, uh, 5 14 to 6 through 16 very familiar passage of scripture. Jesus just laid out the Beatitudes. And then he goes into something else. He says, you're the light of the world. You are the light of the world, not the church. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a blanket or a basket, but on a stand and gives light to all those that are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. See your good works. The Bible said you're saved by faith, not by works, lest any man should boast. But Jesus said they'll see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Very familiar passage of Scripture. I said, Lord, I, I, I don't want to preach that because that, somebody's already preached that. I like to preach new stuff. I like to be deep. But he said, nope, that's what we're going to look at tonight. All believers are meant to be the light of the world. Did you realize that? Yes. 
You are called to be a light. I started to bring the flashlight and have them turn off the lights tonight just to see if you were paying attention. Every one of us is called to be a light. Every one of us is called to share in the darkness. Now, they, they were something that happened at the Olympics here a week ago. And the Christian community was, was upset about it. It was upset, and rightfully so. It was a mockery. But did you expect anything different? Did you really expect the world to act any different? The Bible says in the last days, these things are going to be common. But we are a light. We should be shining to those people because they're blind. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I, I hunt a lot, and I don't like to go in the morning time for one reason and one reason only. I'm not scared of the dark, but I'm scared of what's in the dark. <laughs> <clears throat> I build my tree stands close to the road. And that's just me. Don't sneak up on me. But I always have my light, my flashlight. Always. We're all called to be the light of the world. Back in Jesus' day, they didn't have lights like we have here. They had little lanterns. But those lanterns was a light so that they can see how to go and come. You're a lantern. You're a light. No matter where you may find yourself and no matter what your status in life is right now, we're called to make a, a difference and the best use of our time for Jesus using the skills, talents, resources, and spiritual gifts he's given us. We're to use them to impact the world for Christ and to begin from the from the very community that we live in. In fact, it starts in our own home. Yes, it does. We, had a, we had an evangelist uh, missionary here last week, and he's been called to go. Granted, I don't know if any of you have been called to go, but your mission field might just be your neighbor. But you're called That's to right. do that. You're called to witness to the world, to the lost. They should be able to see you. Can, can they see Christ through you? Are you making a difference? Is your light shining? If we were to turn the lights off, would you glow? If you do, thank God for you. If you're getting there, praise God. But if you're not there, we need to pray that God, you would rekindle the fire that was once in me. Quicken my lamp. Fill me with the oil of the Spirit. Yes. So that whenever the children of God are the light, God shines in the midst of darkness. We're to shine in the middle of darkness around us. We must live a life that is pleasing to God. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 5, chapter 5, 15 and 17, it says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Father is. Do you know what the will of God is? I can tell you this. I, I know this for a fact. I don't have to pray about it. I don't have to see God's face about it. God has called all of us to be witnesses he called us to be evangelists. Evangelist is one that shares the glad tidings. You say, Lord, I, I, I just don't know what to share. I, don't, I can't talk. I can't meet people and carry on a conversation. I'm not Brother Bill. I can't prepare a message and get up and speak before the congregation. Tell them what God has done for you. That's it. That's it. I had the opportunity to hear a gentleman back in my early days, some 20 plus years ago. You won't never find out how old I am. <laughs> and it was a big crowd. It was a big room. And there was, they was a thousand people in there. And this gentleman walked around with a, a limp. And he had a slur about him. He said, my name is Sam. And I had cerebral palsy. This is what crushed me. He said, what is your excuse? What is our excuse from sharing the gospel? 
sharing the gospel. God called us to be the light to the world. We're living in a world that persecutes believers daily, a world that does not honor and respect or reverence the Almighty God, a world that is ready to bring followers of Jesus Christ down to their knees, causing them to compromise if it were so. The society we live in has little concern for moral and ethical integrity. They will do anything to satisfy the lust of the flesh or sinful desires, and it's unfortunate that many believers have fallen prey to Satan's schemes in every day. That's why I said earlier, were you surprised at what happened this week? I'm not even surprised anymore. Nothing shocks me anymore. The mockery about Jesus Christ is... It's, it's just it's, it's, it's so prevalent that it just it doesn't surprise me anymore. But what does surprise me is the Christian's lights are not as bright as they once were. The Christian's lights are not as bright as they once were. There's a lot of, there's a lot of people here tonight, and, that's, and that is good, yes, is. but we should share that gospel with those that are outside those doors. Yeah. The world might not ever step into that door. You might be the only Bible someone reads. You might be only Jesus that somebody sees. Are you portraying that? Are you showing that? Are you living that? For our light to shine for Christ, we must be ready to face that opposition, persecution. And we must strive to maintain our moral standards and our Christian beliefs and integrity. Don't compromise. The Word of God says this, and that's it. It's, it's beyond reproach. There's some things in the Bible that, that we can debate over, but when it comes to sin and what it takes to get into heaven, there is no debate. What color the horse that you're going to ride into heaven on, I don't know. Revelation says a white horse, but it might be a pale horse. It might be a cream-looking horse. I don't know. Jesus reminds us in John 15 and 18 that the world will hate us because they hated him. Don't expect anything different. Don't expect the the world to accept you just because you say I'm a Christian. They're not. You must understand what your purpose is on this earth. Why are you here at this moment in time? Why are you sitting here tonight? I've always wondered, God, what would it have been like to live 40 years ago? I wouldn't have liked it because it's hot as can be and there wouldn't have been any air conditioning. What would it have been like to live in Jesus' day? They walked everywhere and I don't, you look at me, you don't get a body like this walking all the time. They didn't have the hospital to eat lunch at every day either. <laughs> but, but you're in the position you are and, and in the place that you are and you've been called for one reason and one reason only, to share the gospel, to preach the gospel, that others may see your good works and come to know Jesus Christ. Are they seeing that? Is that what's happening? There's a higher calling on your life. You're called to work for the master. Our top priority in life should be to share the gospel. And it doesn't take someone that's got a degree in theology. It doesn't take someone that has been in the ministry for 25 years. It doesn't take someone that's that's seen miracle after miracle after miracle. It only takes you and saying, this is what Jesus Christ done for me. I was a sinner, but now I'm saved. So I told you I was going to take a hard right, and this is where if you don't hold on, you're going to get lost right here. Two reasons, two reasons why our light's probably not shining as bright as it should be. And I said, Lord, these don't go together. Don't, 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 make me, don't make me preach these two things. I, I just don't feel comfortable preaching these two things, but I'm going to hit you right between the eyes tonight. And it hit me. It hit me. 
two things that I think that's hindering the church from being the bright light that we called to be. I want you to stick your tongue out at me. <laughs> Take a picture of it. That tongue is causing a lot of us to not be the brightest light that we can be. Amen. The Bible's crystal clear about that. If you turn over into James, Brother James, if you were, if you want to read some good writing in the New Testament, James has some great writing. James 5 and 12. Or, or chap, I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 5 through 12. Listen to what James says. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts in great things. How great a forest is to set ablaze such by a small fire. The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body setting on fire the entire course of life and setting on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessings and cursings, my brother. These things ought not to be. Doth a spring pour, uh, a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brother, bear olives, nor a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Lord, do I, do I really talk about people? I don't get my hair cut, but ever once every four weeks. Some of you going to get that in just a minute. <laughs> I, let a, I go to a beauty shop. I don't go to the barber shop. The, bar, the barber shop's where they gossip the most. The beauty shop, they don't gossip at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I get all my information from in 30 minutes. But our tongue, how can we bless God? Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We adorate you. We exalt you. I can't believe what she had on in church Sunday. That sorry scandal is in the jail docket again. Out of the mouth that we just praise God. We're rebuking those that need an uplift. James was very critical about that. person may put the faculty of speech to its highest use and then immediately afterwards wickedly abuse it. The tongue has been given to so that we might bless the Lord our Father, to utter praise and uplift his holy name. The Christians call him Lord and Father and bless him and thank him for his redeeming grace. Then when an absolute inconsistently the same mouth that lifted up God tears down others. We backbite, belittle, we speak gossip instead of uplifting. Do we tear down others that are working for the kingdom of God? I'm preaching to me now. <laughs> I mean, I, if you get some of this, great, but I'm preaching to me because I, that is me. Lord, I, 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 I try, I try to stay off Facebook. It's of the devil. So much backbiting going on. We need to be praying for those people. We need to be uplifting those people. Is our light shining out to those people? Or have we said something that dimmed our light? They need prayer and you need practice. Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 3, 
said everything there's a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. It's sometimes it's better to keep your mouth shut. I keep looking over here at this side. I'm going to come over here and look at this side a little bit. Sometimes it's time to keep your mouth closed as Christians. Who are we to judge? I was speaking to someone this week, and uh, that came up, and I said, who left you to judge? Who left me to judge? The Bible says you'll be judged the same way. Three C's, when to speak and not to speak. Three C's. Listen now, three C's. When to speak, when you speak in compassion. Rejoice with those that rejoice and weep with those that weep. People need compassion. People need compassion. This world is tough. Yeah. I'm telling you, it's tough. Yeah. If you don't do nothing but say, hey, Brother Bill, I was thinking about you today. I was thinking about you. I used to have a lady at a church I attended. She, she was frail and older lady, and she really, she felt like there was no calling on her life in the church. We spoke a lot of times about it. But one thing she did, and she did it well, she mailed me a card every month, every week, every two weeks, I'd be down and out, and she said, Brother Chris, I appreciate you singing that song. That touched me. I'm uplifting you in prayer. When we have compassion for the lost, that's one of the important things we can use our tongue for. Two, challenge. Proverbs 27 and 17, it said, As iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpened it in the countenance of his friend. Yes. We should be challenging one another. Hey, Brother Bill, I'm going to be at church Sunday. You better be there. Hey, man, I want you to pray with me. I want you to agree with me that this, this thing comes to pass. Some of you are going to get this. The third C is this. Keep your mouth shut. Now, that doesn't start with a C, does it? It's K. <laughs> But it went along with the three C's. And I spelled it C-E-E-P. Keep your mouth shut. If, the words, if your words damage a friendship, you shouldn't say it. Proverbs 16 and 28 said, A perverse person stirs up conflict and gossip separates a close friend. When you don't have all the facts... How many of that? I work for CNN. I work for Fox. They never have all the facts. I always, being on the school board now for, for a long time, there's three sides to every story. There's one, there's the parent side, there's the school side, and then there's somewhere in the middle. Everybody's got their side. But when you don't have all the facts, you can't make a judgment. And we should refrain from that. He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. Proverbs 18 and 13. If the issue is none of your business, Proverbs 14 and 10, each heart knoweth his own bitterness and no one else can share his joy. Did you see? Did you hear that? Did you hear what they done? So and so's in trouble again. They got a new car. I can't believe them. I bet they're so far in debt they can't never even see how to get out. <laughs> we should be saying, Lord, bless them. If your words damage someone else's reputation, Proverbs 16 and 27, an ungodly man diggeth up evil and his lips there is a burning fire. The tongue, that's what the tongue, 
Colossians 4 and 6 says, let your speech always be with grace. I love this right here. Seasoned with salt. That you may know how you ought to answer every man. It comes with wisdom in God. How do I answer someone? Through divine wisdom in the Lord. You can never be hurt by something you didn't say. Did you hear that? You can never be hurt by something you didn't say. We're going through a political season right now, and I, I've, I've been watching some debates and things, and they'll say, well, you said this. No, I didn't. They'll flip back four years ago, and that person said exactly what they said. We live in a day and age that everything you say and do is recorded, whether you like it or not. But I can tell you this, whether you think it ain't recorded or not, God knows. God knows. Revelations 12 and 11 said, And they overcame me by the blood of the Lamb, meaning they overcame the beast or Satan, and by the word of their testimony, that they loved not their lives unto death. What you say, what you speak, power. There's power in the tongue. There's power in the tongue. Hang on. I told you I was, didn't have it two points. That was one right there. We, we on downhill slide. Number two, by using wisdom from God, we let our light shine. And this one right here challenged me more than, than anything. By wisdom from God. Where does that wisdom come from? Through the Holy Spirit. Yeah. It's so important that we have the Holy Spirit that, that enlightens us. None of us is smarter than God by any means, not even close. He said he took the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. But through the Holy Spirit, wisdom, what is wisdom? Wisdom is the appropriate application of knowledge. Well, what does that mean? And that's so. But upon review, wisdom in the Bible, this is an invaluable virtue. It's one of the gifts of the Spirit. It's invaluable virtue. It's unmeasurable. It's priceless, and it's rare. It's like saying Jesus is the Redeemer. That's true. But yet, if you don't know the Redeemer, you really don't know what... The, what that definition is. This, this is what baffled me so much as I was studying this. I only had a couple of days to get this, this one prepared, but I, I said, Lord, I said, now, I've got a couple degrees. I've been to school a long time. And some people said, I got 12 years of high school and four years of summer school. <laughs> <laughs> But what is, what is wisdom, really? What is wisdom? And as I began to study and, and dig into it a little deeper, I said, Lord, I'm missing out on what you really called me to have. I'm shallow, Lord. I'm not mature in the word as I should be. And I, and I, I began to do this, kick myself in the rump for not being having the wisdom that God had called me to have. As Christians, you can make all the excuses you want about not knowing and not, not understanding who God is and not having the wisdom that God called you to be, but you can't blame nobody but yourself. There's, no, there's nobody else to blame but yourself. And I said, Lord, now that you got me into this, I, I, I can see Proverbs 1, 20 and 22 20 through 22 says, wisdom cries aloud in the street, in the market. She raises her voice. At the hand of the noisy street, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gate, she speaks, how long? How long, O simple ones? How long will you love being simple? You see, Solomon had an understanding of what wisdom was. Solomon knew what it meant to have wisdom beyond his means. God had blessed him with wisdom and knowledge. James 1 and 5 says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives it generously of all reproach, and it will be given to him. You know, I just said that whose fault is it that you don't have wisdom? Whose fault is it that you don't have understanding in the word of God? 
point your finger at yourself because the Bible says that let him ask of God and he gives it freely. Solomon, 1 Kings 3, 8 and 13, and your servant is in the midst. This is Solomon speaking. And he said, your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen a great people, too many to number and count for the multitude. Could you imagine? He'd be like the president today. He's just Give me wisdom to, and to figure out how to lead these people. Give your servant, therefore, understanding, mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern such a great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said, because thou hast asked this and have not asked for your long life or riches or life from your enemies, but have asked yourself of understanding to discern what is right and wrong. Behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind so that none like you has been before and none like you shall arise after. I give you also what you have not asked for, both riches and honor. Wow, Lord. I didn't ask for riches and honor. I'm asking for wisdom. And God said, I'll bless you with way more than that. God desires us to have the wisdom of the word. He doesn't desire for us to be, for lack of better terms, as Brother Bill said in the Greek, stupid. He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't want us to be ignorant to the fact of what the word of God says. He wants us to know. He wants us to have the understanding I'm intrigued by things in the Bible. I, I, I love to teach Sunday school. I'll tell you, I, I look forward to Sunday morning to teach. I'm intrigued by things in the Bible. And certain things like faith, I'm just, I'm, I'm neck deep in the faith and, and, and understanding of what it is and what it's talking about. When, if you had the faith of a grain of mustard seed, say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea. And I've, I've studied that out. Lord, I, I know I've got more than a mustard seed. The mountain should be closer. Pull them down. Instead of being in Tennessee, put them in Dothan. You know what I'm saying? That'd be better, wouldn't it? They're not, they're not appreciative of that. I want that knowledge and wisdom so that my light, getting back to what we were called to do, so that my light may shine to a dark world, that they may see my good works and glorify my Father, which is in heaven. Not to glorify me, but to glorify my Father, which is in heaven. Wisdom is, in fact, a divine gift that is granted by God whenever any believer asks. Whenever you ask, he's not going to just bestow it upon you. Proverbs 1 and 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So let me ask you the question. Who really is wise and has the understanding? Do you consider yourself wise? Do you consider yourself knowledgeable? Or is it the Pharisees? Or, or is it just the one who claims to be? I, when I started, I started at FSU, I was just a small fish in a gigantic ocean. They was, man, those classes had two or three hundred people in them. They didn't know who I was from Adams Haskett. We was only by a number, and they didn't even know my number. We had to write our social security number on our paper. Now you don't want you to write your social security number on anybody's paper. That lets me know nobody stole my paper. <laughs> Nobody's got my identity. If I was smart, they'd have my social security number by now. They like, that guy, he, we don't even want him. But we, we had a small accounting class, and there was about 20 of us in there. This little lady came in. She, her name, I'll never forget her name. She's about this tall, four foot five at max. Her name was Miss Porsche. She was old then. 
She said, this is counting 2204, whatever. For y'all that's in the wrong class, get up and leave. About four of them peeled out. <laughs> so we're down to 16. She said, I'm going to go ahead and let you know that half of you is going to fail this class. And she didn't lie. I dropped it. <laughs> I didn't fail it. I was not ready for it. But she said the next class, half of you is going to fail it. And she didn't lie. When it was all said and done, the people that I started with and uh, that started the accounting program at FSU, only about seven or eight of us, ten of us made it out. Did we have all the knowledge and wisdom we needed? No, we didn't. But what she was saying is she weeded those out, those that didn't have it. They got weeded out quickly. The temptation of knowledge is to be arrogant and impractical. James' definition was that the idea of practical wisdom that enables one to live a life of godliness. Actions speak louder than words. People's going to see your light before they hear your voice. You hear me? They're going to see you from afar. That's where the wise men were coming from. They were coming from afar. They're going to see you before they hear you. They're going to see you before they enter this church. You're a billboard for Jesus Christ. Is your lights on? I pass by Krispy Kreme because this is the devil. <laughs> but if the lights are on, I might wheel up in there. Or you're a light. This is anointed, right? It, that, that, that stuff's like the showbread in the, in the Old Testament temple. It like melts in your mouth. True spiritual wisdom will be seen in right conduct and moral behavior. The wise man's works are not merely the, uh, are not merely the facts he teaches, but the deeds he lives. If wisdom does not transform your life, it's worthless. If spiritual wisdom doesn't transform your life, it's worthless. You've missed it. You've missed it. You've missed it. True spiritual wisdom will change the way you live. It will change who you are as a Christian. And it will make you an effective light for those that are lost. They can see a phony. There's no question about the world. They can see a phony. This wisdom is pure. It's holy like God. This wisdom is peaceful. It's peaceable. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. This wisdom is gentle. It carries the meaning of moderation without moral compromise and is courteous and forbearing. Another confirmation I got today was a lady that was not a Christian. I knew she wasn't a Christian based on the, the commercial that she was presenting. If she was, she was being held against her will. But what she said about the issue in the, at the Olympics was this. She said, yes, it was wrong. It was wrong and it was a mockery. But what challenged her was, was the, the way the Christians reacted and didn't say, Lord, forgive them for they, they're not what they do. Jesus hung on the cross. They crucified the man. I would have been calling fire down from heaven. I would have been consuming them. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. They have no knowledge of who you are. If you expect the world to live any, any way different, you're fooling yourself. They're living the way the, the world, the way Satan wants them to live, contrary to the word of God. You need the knowledge and wisdom of the Word and the Holy Spirit to direct you and guide you in how to say and when to say it and what to say to those that are lost. You've got to plant a seed. And that seed sometimes you think, well, Lord, that was just wasted. It might take a year. It might take two years. It might take 15 years. But he said, my word shall not return void. 
It's easy to entreat it. It's open for reason, but it's not open for compromise. We need to admit when we're wrong. It's full of mercy and it's good fruits. This word is full of mercy and it's good. But don't, don't be caught up in God's mercy. God is not mocked. The Bible said he's not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. It's without partiality for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all are sinners. Who am I to judge and say that I'm better than you? I didn't do that. And it's without hypocrisy. It's divine wisdom. It's sincere and genuine. If it's not, then it's not of God. I'll leave you with this. And boys, I'm telling you, I try to get out of here at 730, 729. But this closing is going to take a while. Brother Juno said, I'm circling. The word, the world, need desperately to hear and see the light of Christ in our words and our actions. Mankind needs to praise our Father in heaven. Mankind needs to see Christ, Christ righteousness. Believers are salt and light. As I was reading back in Matthew 5, it says, you're the, you're the salt. I don't eat bland food. I just, I just don't. I like a little salt on it. That it, you may become blameless. I'm sorry. Paul wrote, to do everything without grumbling and complaining so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault and a crooked and a deprived generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. I'll leave you with this. I challenge you. I can remember camping when I was a kid some 20 plus years ago. We would go down. Nobody camps anymore in a tent. They'd have a motor home. It's hard to get a motor home down on the sandbar. And we always camped on the sandbar like this. It was almost like sleeping, standing up. Um, my dad had an old lantern. He pumped that sucker up, whoo, light it. it. Sometimes it would blaze up, and I'm like, I'm going to burn this place down. But it would go out finally. But that light was great. It was, it was awesome. For about three hours. And then all of a sudden, got it. Lower and lower and lower and lower. Eventually it would go out. As Christians, if you don't keep your life pumped up, you'll burn out. That's why it's so important to come forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. We need to come together, gleam on one another, understand wisdom as, as iron sharpeneth iron. Thank you for having me tonight. And I challenge you, let your light so shine. I was going to sing that little song, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And I, my wife said she'd sing it with me, but she's not coming up. <laughs> but I challenge you tonight, let your light shine that others may see your good works. Glorify your Father, which is in heaven.